All right. Well, hey. We should well, chat about where to stick this. <laughs> and we can well, post it all over, but. <laughs> well, welcome to Wildly Healthy Today with your host, Casey Maxwell, and Sf Raw and Matt Rowe of Parsley Pet. In during this sh our show, we are talking about your pet's health, raw feeding, and you know what, Casey? Welcome to the show this week. I'm so excited to be doing this. Yes, I'm excited too. We just got like a few seconds to kind of touch base before we hit things going, and we're trying to get a little, a little, a few little. Uh, we're always sort of tinkering with the technology to make it better. Mm -hmm. And uh, right. so I am the host, and he's the co-host. Usually. Matt host. So we're actually streaming live today on the SF Raw Facebook page. Now, eventually we were talking about the fact that we'd love to have it all go into the Wildly Healthy Raw page, but not many people know about that page. Right now we're going to the Parsley Pet page and remember the SF Raw page today, but eventually we have one place where everyone can follow. So if you're not currently following and subscribing to or following the Wildly Healthy Live Facebook page, if you go there, that would be a great place for both of the Parsley Pet followers and all the SFR followers to go to one place where everyone can look at it and then we can distribute it across all the channels, but that way we don't have anyone missing it and not seeing, because I was getting a lot of feedback that people were missing these live streams because it wasn't live on Facebook or the uh, SFR Facebook page. So that was the problem. So we just want to make sure everybody's able to see this. And today's topic, which we just came up with, which is how we roll, <laughs> is... Uh, I love it. So we're going to talk about calcium and the dog diet. Well, dogs and cats. I'm going to sort of talk a little bit about cats because I have some theories and um, experience based on the or theories based on my experience of 30 years of feeding over 30 years of feeding cats raw and dogs. Raw. Um, but we were talking about how it corresponds with the information that Parsley Pet is gathering with the tests that you're doing, the hair mineral analysis, mm -hmm. and some of the great information that you're getting regarding calcium and the instances that you see within that population of people who are submitting the test, what, you know, is it, is it more or less common to see way too much calcium or too little calcium? And what does that mean? And if they're feeding and in, you know, what they're feeding or not feeding or how their body's metabolizing it. So, um, yeah, I'll start with the top of it is I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about the importance of calcium and just some basic parameters that people can make sure to understand is when you're feeding a, a DIY raw diet, so you're not buying something that's prepared, but maybe you are buying something that's prepared, and sometimes this happens, and I just want to talk about this sort of as a little bit of a cautionary statement, is a lot of times you go to like a local butcher shop, and you may be doing this more and more right now during the COVID-19 crisis, and you're going to have to shop locally or find alternative sources right now. Um, maybe your local butcher shop, they are allowed, at least in uh, California, and I think in most states, um, a lot of um, requirements or uh, legal, uh, you know, designations and who's certified or licensed or allowed to do certain things in butcher shops and uh, like grocery butcher shops and things like that. They are allowed to take sort of whatever's the leftovers and grind that up and call it a pet food and sell it. And they're allowed to do that in California. Anything that's a pet food is sold, has to be sold with sales tax. It has to be sold that it's not fit for human consumption. And legally, it should be in other places, but not in a butcher shop um, in that setting because they're sort of um, exempt from that. But other places, like for example, at SFR, we're as CDFA, which is the California Department of Food and Agriculture licensed and inspected facility and an establishment to make that food. So then it will say not for human consumption. I'll have our establishment number on there, and that shows that we are operating under those um, parameters and conditions. Um, and so, but with them, they'll just say, well, this is pet food and they can sell it to you. And that can be about 10% of, um, of maybe what they're doing that day, like at the end of the day. So we have all of our um, safety measures in place here. So social distancing six feet away from people. Thank you. So as you guys can see, Casey's working at the same time that she's doing the show, which I love. Yeah. I love the fact yeah, that moved our hand washing station while I did the video, so I apologize yeah. for that. Um, so anyway, um, one of the things I wanted to mention is that when you're getting those things from your local butcher shop, do you understand that it's done by a butcher and they're trying to use up the things that they have that are, um, you know, maybe you know, they've had end of day leftover things, scraps. But it's not been something that a nutritionist has looked into and, and verified and made sure that it's balanced or right. 
components of the diet that you need. So you can use that. I'm totally cool with people using that as part of their DIY program, but go into it with eyes wide open, understanding and recognizing that that is a wild card and a joker. So it's something that you can put into the mix, keep your pricing down maybe, it's a good budget friendly thing to do, but do not use that as your foundation or your base of all of your meals because that's gonna be you know, changing all the time. They don't know what they're doing when it comes to nutritional balance. Um, I heard of one place that was adding in yogurt for calcium, which is completely inadequate. You cannot get anywhere necessary amounts of calcium by adding in yogurt or dairy. That's just totally not true. No, and a dog shouldn't have that level of dairy. Uh, excuse me? I don't think a dog should have that level of dairy going into the diet. Well, it's not going to give you the calcium you need. It's just not right. Okay. So, yeah, you're not I mean, it's just not. It, it, it was that, so, and it was great that they were making this fresh diet and everything. But the problem is, is it's completely not balanced in any way for right. need for the minimums that we the know as far as the calcium phosphorus balance is concerned. Right. So, what I usually tell people is keep that within about no more than thirty percent maximum, but you want to try and minimize that as part of the components of the overall menu that you're creating so that at least the rest of the menu that you're doing is 100% balanced. And then you have this little, like kind of almost like a seasonal food or a home offering or scraps or something like, kind of think of it as far as that goes, and it'll maybe keep your cost down, but you want to make sure that the foundation of the diet is a balanced diet. And what that looks like when it comes to calcium and phosphorus specifically, because that's the topic of today's show, Cats, it's going to be a one to one, up to one to 0.3 or one to 0.4 percent, or not percent, but ratio of calcium and phosphorus in the diet. Now, yep. people don't think about well, where's the phosphorus? The phosphorus is in bone, it's in bone, it's in all of the foods, so it's in a high amount in the muscle meat, the organs, all of the things you need, even in veggies and even in grains or any other you know, fillers that you're adding into the diet that you don't think you should be, but they do. But if people do add those things in, that also includes the phosphorus. So all of those things have high and abundant amounts of phosphorus in them, but the bone has more calcium, is able to balance the calcium. So it has a higher calcium level in it, and that's what we use to balance the rest of the phosphorus in the diet. Um, and so if you aren't using bone and you can use whole bone, um, and you can find online, there's places like the uh, Perfectly Awesome website, and there's some other websites where you can find in books that will have um, the actual elemental calcium or the percent calcium in each of the different whole raw mini bones that you're doing. Like for example, like a whole quail, it's about 10% bone uh, or calcium. So that's something that you're able to figure out um, your calcium amounts. And But kind of a good general rule, like if people are just trying to eyeball it, which I don't recommend necessarily unless you have a nutritionist helping you through this on a, on a case by case basis. But one thing I usually recommend is to start with like 50% of the plate or the meal being a nice mini bone that's fully consumable, not like a marrow bone or a recreational bone or something that they just chew on, but something that they fully consume. And then the other 50% can be their meat and the organs and the eggs and the dairy and the fish and all that other kinds of things. Now, it is its own category, I believe, and I like that too, because that does have a balanced calcium process ratio. So when you're eating tripe, that can be up to, but no more in my opinion, 30% um, of the diet, but that's sort of independent because it does have a balanced calcium process ratio. So if you're feeding more than one thing that has a balanced calcium process ratio, you can put those in combination because independently each one of those are balanced so they can be fed together. You're not gonna create an imbalance, but if you put something like that into a diet, that was, um, you know, that was not balanced, then you may be causing, you know, don't think that you're creating a balance by adding that in. And then um, other option would be if you're not doing bone and you want to go to the other uh, ways of feeding calcium or providing out of calcium, the calcium phosphorus with levels in the uh, meals, then you can go with something like an eggshell powder, which you can make at home or you can buy. Um, I usually recommend making that at home because then you can be in control of getting good well-sourced eggs and from pasture-raised animals um, that are hopefully unwashed, which would be ideal, but not everybody has those. And they include the eggshell membrane, which is a good, um, it's actually a good sort of supplementary food that would be supportive of the joint health. So it's like an actual joint um, component to it to benefit the joints and mobility. Um, and then those eggshells, you just dry them and you have to pulverize them into a very, very, very fine dust because unless it's a very fine, like a fine powder, it's not uh, absorbable by the animal as calcium. It'll go through and won't get, won't get um, 
they can't get the adequate calcium out of it and how clean you grind it and all of those things and actually where you get the eggs and even eggs from like certain countries can have more or less different mineral compositions and different breeds of chickens can have different mineral compositions. But in general, we do have a pretty good idea of a nice average so that that can help you with how, determining how much of that you need to add into the diet. Um, and then the other thing would be something like a seaweed calcium. Animal Essentials has a nice product that I like to recommend. I like recommending that for animals that have like a lot of food allergies and intolerances. Mm -hmm. now, People get really confused that seaweed has calcium. Seaweed has calcium, but if you're feeding kelp, gull, spirulina, which is not really seaweed, it's a freshwater um, uh, plant organism, basically. Uh, but um, what you want to do is th those things are all providing different nutrients. The seaweed okay. calcium is calcium that's been derived from seaweed, but that's a calcium supplement. So there's a distinction between the seaweed supplement, which provides like iodine and you know, trace minerals versus a calcium supplement that's derived from a seaweed base. Um, because seaweed, you know, calcium can come from all different sources. It can come from beef bone, it can come from eggshell powder, it can come, you know, it can be something that's made in the lab, like a some sort of like a calcium carbonate, calcium citrate, something like that. Um, and the other thing that would be a nice, so we have the eggshell powder, we have the whole bones, which are great, ground bones, which is another option. So it's kind of going from, from best to, you know, the best possible thing is the whole bone, in my opinion, if you can do that. Then, if you don't, then we have the um, eggshell powder, the seaweed calcium, and the um, bone meal. And the different bone meals, steam bone meal powder, just a moment, please. All right, so I think she left to go get some stuff. Um, no, 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 and we actually threw a recipe on our side for eggshell powder. That's someone waiting up front, so I want to make sure they're helped. Um, That's okay. So, but I have a question, Casey, before you keep going. How much eggshell powder, and because... Let me, I'm going to grab the balls and I'll show it. Actually, I can do yeah. a show and tell, so just to... Yeah, see. That's great. So, yeah, I mean, knowing the right levels of calcium you want to add to the diet, but minerals have a, a symbiotic relationship with other minerals, so you want to make sure that you're adding not just calcium alone, but you're adding phosphorus as well, which you can get from muscle meat. All right, let's see what you got, Casey. Okay, so first off, this is our eggshell powder. Go back a little bit more by your nose. Eggshell powder. Yeah, there we go. We see it. Yes. All right. So this All is right. made by us or one of our members who is awesome, and she's been making this for us for years, so it's pretty cool. And as you so the eggshell powder is the same as the seaweed calcium, as far as what you want to do. So the animal essential seaweed calcium, people have maybe seen this online. Most people can buy this, which is really great, so it's easy to purchase if people need to buy. Um, you're going to do about three grams to each pound of home prepared commercial raw food, or as directed by your veterinarian or nutritionist. Um, so that's only, it's really easy. It's just one teaspoon for every pound of meat, so that's 16 ounces of uh, okay. Well, it's not just meats, it's the meat, the organs, basically the food that doesn't have adequate calcium, you can do one teaspoon of this and it's going to bring it up to at least the minimum, which is good. Okay. Now, I do want to talk about that, that's what we're going to get into, is that um, the minimums and for dogs and for cats, um, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So that's going to be like your baseline, like making sure that there's a balance of one-to-one -one calcium and phosphorus in the diet. Now, I think that that's really something that we need to think about because I think for cats and for dogs, that's going to give you your minimum. But I do think personally that dogs, well, dogs can go from a one to one to a two to one ratio, and cats can go to one to one to about 1.3 to 1.5 max. Um, I think that dogs have a higher requirement for bone in the diet, and that means a higher requirement for calcium in the diet operate ideally. In my personal opinion, I think that they can eat a lot more bone than we probably think they can eat. And so um, that's going to be uh, that's going to be the thing I want to talk about today. Um, in addition to all these other things, just like kind of off the top is, you know, making sure if you're buying like some, you know, something from a butcher shop, knowing that's not balanced and being careful with that. Knowing that the cat has calcium phosphorus which is 1.1 to 1.3 or 4. Um, and then with dogs, it's 1 to 1 to 2 to 1 ratio with the calcium being more predominant there. Um, and that there's a variety of ways to do that without the bone. But I do think that the bones are good. And even if you're feeding like SFRAS, uh, grinds, and formulas, 
those are intended to be fed along with additional bone if you would like, or if it's easier for you to do, you can add in up to, we recommend usually about 30% raw meaty bones. Um, but I do think that dogs have a higher, a much higher requirement for bones than what we've been told. And I think that that one-to-one -one minimum, I would like to see that brought up a little bit higher for most dogs. Um, and I think that what you should look at is their stool quality more than anything else. So if you have a stool that are very small, well formed, sort of like little, almost like little dry rocks almost, sometimes people we'll call those bony turds or bone hoops. And um, I think that's that's okay. I think that's okay. Um, a little bit like um, more voluminous than that is okay too. But if you go into like the large or fluffy or soft hoops, with a lot of fillers in place and that's what you'll see with like a kibble fed dog. I don't think that that's what you want to accomplish when you're eating a home repair diet. I think that going for kind of the drier, harder, more compact stools is really what you should be looking for um, raw fed pet. And so looking towards, because you know with the work that you do at Parsley Pet and the nutritional analysis test, that shows that on an individual level, individual metabolisms and abilities to metabolize those different nutrients and how they're able to absorb right. and utilize them, it's gonna be different on a case-by-case -case basis with your animals. So the best determining factor is to use a tool like the Hartley Pest Pet Nutritional Analysis Tool, um, Hair Mineral Analysis, um, Nutritional Blueprint, is what we call it, which I love that. Um, and then, uh, or in, in addition to that, looking at their stool. Because the stool the individual animal will really be the most informative day-to-day -day way for you to just maintain that you're doing the correct levels of calcium in the diet in my opinion i think that's a very yeah. cool tool to use so if you're looking at that and you're seeing this great stool you kind of want it to look like if you've ever gone hiking and you see like a scat on the trail and it's from a carnivore like a coyote or um if it's from a wild cat like a mountain lion or something like that you'll see there's all this um, fibrous material which is the fur which that's great you can do that when you're a raw feeder and you can pray model, that's amazing. Um, and so it's going to be wrapped in these sort of little, very dry, kind of whiter colored, um, uh, bony kind of turds. And that's that's actually what you want to accomplish when we're feeding a home prepared DIY raw diet. Um, then we also have, I was going to show you also the bone meal. So this mm -hmm. is the bone meal that we Yeah, have. from now brand. Yeah. Um, and to also be mindful that all of the different bone meals, like sometimes you'll see Solgar or you'll see other brands. Every brand is actually going to have different um, calcium levels and now has changed their formulation quite a bit over the years. I've been using it for many, many years and they do a good, pretty good job with their, you know, third party verification and testing and analysis to make sure that it's clean of heavy metals and comes from good small source cattle. Um, it is based um, calcium, bone calcium. But then now they used to add eggshell powder for a little while and they stopped doing that. And then now they add calcium carbonate and magnesium oxide. Um, so they're adding other things besides just the beef bone meal to that. And that may or may not be a problem for your animals. <coughs> decide if you're Excuse me. That or not. <laughs> um, and so. Um, well, it's interesting that they add magnesium. The label and see what the elemental calcium is for it. So what but this is saying is and you know it says let me see if we can look provides approximately 800 milligrams of calcium per serving and serving as a teaspoon um, do they have the weight based upon that based on the actual individual taking it or are they basically saying for like an adult oh, no. this, is a, this is a human food supplement right, or right. human supplement um food based calcium supplement for humans and so they don't say that for it's per the weight of the food not for the weight of the animal because okay. you balance the food not mm -hmm. the food that you're feeding um sure. that's how you would usually do it not that's how you would pair it and but it's i do think yeah i think the dogs have a higher requirement for calcium than what we previously may have thought and i think the cats have a higher organ requirement than what we previously may have thought yes my theory um, that I've had for a few years now, and I just um, I love hearing from you and hearing that a lot of times um, you are seeing that the calcium can be a little bit low. Now it'd be great if you the samples from kitties too. Eventually, someday maybe. Someday I hope. Now we're just we're still working on the dogs. labs. But yeah, <laughs> um, and then I also want to talk about the differences. So some people say, well, how do I choose, and what's the difference? 
you know, a lot of times I do think that that the whole bone or the fresh bone ground up, mm -hmm. um, and then the use of bone dust, which is another thing that would come from like a processing plant or a butcher facility, mm -hmm. it's going to be the little fine dust that's used that comes off of usually like a Hobart meat saw. So like mm -hmm. on the meat and the pieces that have bone in it, and at the end of the right. day, it's collected in the uh, catch basin there, and that's usually a mix of um, you know connected tissue, fat, you know little pieces of meat, and then it'll have bone. That the problem with that is that's totally not standardized. It's again like the butcher shop a little bit, um, and so you can use it kind of as a treat. Um, and the the danger with using that is you never ever ever want to just feed that as like a claw because that can cause um, a blockage in the body. Even though mm -hmm. it, up, it creates kind of like a mass, so it creates like a massive. Yeah. And they can block them. So you want to be really careful with that and make sure that you sprinkle it over food or you mix it into other food. And you can use it if you'd like to, but I wouldn't want you to rely on that as your main source of calcium because it does vary so much and it's not standardized and it would be hard for you to maybe right. make a determination. But the nice thing about bone is that it has other things included in it. And so bone is about it's one third organic, uh, that's 30 to 35 percent organic material, and percent two thirds, so like 65 you know, percent, 70 percent of it's inorganic material. And mm -hmm. the inorganic material, that's where you're going to have all the mineral composition. And with the mineral, it's going to be calcium, phosphorus, oxygen, and hydrogen. But it's also got these other trace minerals that you know are in the marrow, and people don't know marrow and bones. So it's got a lot of fiber and a lot of fat. And if you're raising that animal and you know, like things like red blood cells and there's all kinds of cool stuff in there. It's not just right. calcium, you know? So the nice thing about the eggshell calcium is it has that eggshell membrane, which is really cool. But the great thing about feeding bone, which is really ideal for dogs, um, is it has all these other components in it that we may not even understand fully about how beneficial that is for our dogs. But one of the things that it includes is that other 30% of it is the um, the organic inner, uh, organic material, and that's going to be collagen. So collagen is something that can be, you know, sometimes it doesn't get the, um, you know, status it deserves with, with pet nutrition, because a lot of times they'll just categorize that as protein. Um, they're making like pet foods and things like that, like a cooking diet or something. Um, so that, but that's like a, it's basically kind of a, well, they're like, well, it's indigestible, blah, blah, blah. But I think what it is, is it's actually like a, a fiber that's ideal and uniquely suited to our carnivores that may actually act. And I don't know, this is totally not proven, but perhaps it's something that helps contribute to digestive and gut health. It helps with the, you know, maybe it serves as some sort of prebiotic fiber to maintain a good uh, flora within the gut with the microbiome. Um, you know, that's something that we're learning so much about now. So I do think that there's a lot of uh, fantastic benefits. Um, there's a lot of fantastic benefits to um, feeding that because you're going to get the collagen. You're going to get a nice array of minerals, and in addition to the calcium, you get a whole bunch of other cool minerals um, and other things and fats. Um, so I think that it's really something that provides a lot of nutritional benefits, not just that that calcium, the calcium carbonate, calcium citrate. It's going to be just that one thing. Um, so there's benefits and risks to every single thing. If you really like to get into a spreadsheet and calculate things up for you, then that gives you a lot of comfort to do that. That's one way to do it. And in that respect, then maybe you do want to go with a calcium citrate or calcium carbonate or something along those lines. Um, but my preference is to always go with whole foods and to go with the species appropriate food, and that's going to be gone. You know, that's just like my first preference. Um, you know, right. always hope open to whatever is people are most comfortable feeding and what they'd like to do. And I can even help them with that. It's essential and important. So. And your pre-model raw mix that you have has bone in it already. Is that of correct? Of course, yeah. So what we do is we, yeah. take, we take a whole animal and we grind it up. So mm -hmm. instead of like other companies, like pretty much every other company because it's less expensive to do, they will use like inexpensive parts and pieces, like they'll use the thighs or the backs or carcasses or something like that. But what we do is we take like the best, you know, Thanksgiving centerpiece turkey that you're gonna buy that you splurge yeah. on because it's like the most amazingly raised heritage breed, pastured wild turkey is super phenomenal. Um, and we get that from our suppliers because we have a good relationship 
for them as far as making sure that we commit to them for a certain amount um, that we'll be buying from them and reasonably. And maybe they'll give us the bee birds. So it's like the ones that aren't, they're like raised in the exactly the same way, handled in the exact same way, you know, everything, they're retail, they're beautiful. But there was something like maybe one of the wings was a little bit small or, you know, something's like a little, we call them bee birds and it, they're just, like from an A grade to a B grade, it's just, it's got something that's a little bit imperfect with it as far as the beauty and the presentation of it. Um, nothing as far as the quality and the integrity and the safety of the product. So those are what we got it. So we go with the entire animal, which is much more sensitive to do, but I feel very strongly that because I've been doing this 30 years, I've learned that there's so much we still need to learn and don't know that I want to get as close to nature as possible. Now, because I'm Thing I have to do things that are fit for human consumption. It means it comes from a USDA or state uh, licensed uh, and um, inspected facility and it's also inspected and certified fit for human consumption as an ingredient. Then I put it into my grinder. Then two seconds later, it becomes not fit for human consumption because of my licensing, but that's what I put in. So it's not going to have, I'm not grinding a whole rabbit with the fur and the skin and the entrails and the heads um, necessarily, things like that, all of that. But if I can get those things that are coming from a licensed and certified facility, um, we'll put that in. And that's something that I can include in my diet. But that, because it, they take the feather, like for, for example, the chicken, I do get the head and I do get the feet, but they've taken the feathers off and the skin off and they've drained it of the blood, they've cleaned up inside, they've taken out the, um, all of the evisceration, you know, all of the, like the, um, basically the intestines, and they, then they put back in um, the heart, the liver, the kidney, the uh, gizzards, and things like that. They've all been cleaned up and fit for human consumption. So that's wonderful because I include all of that in my grind. It's the entire animal. There may be something in that right. I really don't know about yet that's so important and beneficial. And probably why my food, um, when people go from a different hot food to mine, they'll notice big changes in the, because of the quality of things that I'm doing. And also that I am doing the whole entire animal, not just parts and pieces to create um, the balance as far as calcium phosphorus is concerned and that kind of thing. But also what I want people to be aware of is that in my opinion, it's missing the fur, the, fur, the hide, the blood. I think that those are missing components because we are feeding these sort of cleaned up you know, presented for human consumption, and um, you know they've been processed basically to be something that someone could eat, which makes them really clean right. and safe, and that's great. But then I also think that those are parts of the diet that I'd like to be able to put back in in some capacity. So you know, we sell like rabbit feet and rabbit heads and rabbit, you know, blood. We also feed. We have like you know whole chips and whole quail, things like that that you could add in. Now, not everybody's comfortable with that, and so I'm also with them feeding in something that would be like an insoluble fiber like psyllium husk powder or you know some other you know like inland or something that comes from large you know they can feed other things but i want them to be aware that there may be those prebiotics and that insoluble fiber from the feather in the fur that might be missing and then the hide we want to put back in the collagen so that's of course in the meat and it's in all of the different like tissue and the grizzly stuff in the in the fibers, like their ligaments and tendons and stuff like that. But then we might want to ask that they want to add, like maybe they make a home cooked uh, broth, a bone broth that's very mineral or uh, collagen rich, or maybe they want to buy a collagen supplement and add that in. Um, and then the other thing would be that there's going to be some minerals that might be missing from that because of the blood that's missing. So they can buy the blood that in, or we can add in a super calcium supplement that we make, which is kelp, dulls, spirulina, and wakame, which I think is a nice blend. Um, but you want to add things in that are going to put back that mineral. And then you never know, even with our stuff that's raised on these regenerative farms and are coming from our nutrient-dense soil-based um, um, there's still maybe missing elements of minerals compared to an ancestral uh, environment, an ancestrally, you know, like the ancestral diet, if we're looking way back to a primordial diet in those times, it may have been mineral, more, even more mineral rich. Minerals are so important. It changes their behavior, their itching, their, yes. their skin, their mood, their behavior. All of those things are super dependent upon not only hormones and what they're eating and, you know, um, the glycemic index of foods, but also the mineral content. All of those things are super important. 
So not yeah. the calcium, maybe what you're getting and benefiting when you're feeding that bone, but you're getting these other things as well. So um, see if I'm missing anything. Oh, just the keratin, phospholipids, that just means the fat, um, and then the chondroitin that's also included in the bone. So all of those things are something that right. add in. And uh, I don't know, I've probably brought this up every episode, it seems like I've been, or maybe I talked about it in some other show, but I'm <laughs> getting a little confused. But, um, but basically, I'm doing so much every day. But um, you know, one of the things too is that the different, people say, oh, I'm feeding chicken, so I'm all set. And I have my collagen, but there's different, there's at least five or six different types of collagen and eating collagen meets certain needs and is best, best you know, applied towards certain things that you're trying to do like joints. Um, whereas the pork collagen is going to be better for the skin. And so there's going to yeah. be different things, different components of different types of collagens that will meet different needs and have different functions in the body. So that's why it's important to do the, you know, rotation and do different, um, you know, not to stick with one protein all the time, which is another another topic. But um, yeah. the, the different bones and the, the way that they're raised all have very um, significant changes as far as what you're actually feeding and what they're able to get from that. And that's why I think it's better to do the whole food because you are getting all of those other areas that you would be missing if you just fed just a calcium straight supplement. Or so for example, yeah, I mean, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. No, no, you're good, Casey. For example, I just wanted to say that, you know, we can't grind a whole cow and we can't grind a whole pool, a pig. So we, there are limits to what we're able to do. So recognizing that we do our best, but then that sort of allows some opportunity with those because what we'll do is with our beef and the um, pork, we actually add this as the calcium source. And then that lends those, those two flavors to be something because this is a steamed bone marrow product, which you can, it's a, indeed, it's already steamed. That means that those foods that we make, like the brine and the formula with the steamed bone meal as a calcium, and it doesn't have the ground bone in it, you can actually feed that cooked or raw. So when yeah. someone's going through a crisis or an acute situation where they may need to feed a cooked diet for a little bit, they can go to the beef or the pork and they can utilize it and, and heat it without any concerns for safety when it comes to the calcium or the bone. Um, right. and but with all the other ones, like the ducks, all the small ones in the poultry, so ducks, uh, rabbits, chickens, turkeys, all the we grind the entire animal with the feet and the head and everything we can really get in there because the, the omegas in the brains are so important and all that. So we benefit from right. the, uh, you know, their neurological function. Um, this is my, this is Tom. He was our chef. He's not, he's not working as our chef anymore. Though. Hello, Tom. Hi. It's so good to see you. I want to hug him. But we're doing our social, social distance. Yeah, you got a social distance. I know. <laughs> so it's so good to see him. How's it going? Good. Yeah, you can over there. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was pretty hard. It is very hard. Royal wine is real hard. Yeah. 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 Like shutting down. Was the cow. A lot of people shut me down. Yeah. I'm trying to keep strong here, guys. It's been hard. Yeah, anyway, another topic. But hey, we'll stay in touch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. He's doing shark cutery now, which is his dream job. So I'm super happy. Oh, awesome. Okay. Uh, anyway, um, so um, where were we? we were, you were talking and I interrupted you. No, 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 you are right. And you're all right. And that's where, you know, by feeding the whole animal, you're getting all that variety of organ meat. You're getting the variety of different types of, like, instead of just one element of the bone, you're getting the entire bone. And so that's where, you know, and everything that we teach is on some point is you're really wanting the whole animal, just like you had just described and talked about, because that's what they would eat in the wild. And if we take parts of it away, or we strip off just sections of it, then I believe we are limiting some of those other minerals, those trace minerals that are critical for a diet that we really, we can, yeah, we can take a look at calcium, we can take a look at iron, we can look at the macro, the big elements that are out there, but it doesn't show the supportive and the um, symbiotic relationship that these minerals have together. So, for example, when you look That's at calcium, huge. it's got to have huge. magnesium in order to go into it. It's got to have phosphorus. But if we just strip it out and just feed calcium, 
the bone actually, the actual, you're not going to absorb that into the system to create that healthy bone structure that you want calcium to do. And the enormous- yeah, I mean, and then function. you're missing out on the collagen and the fat. Right. And, you know, that, that, you know, a lot of like um, pet food nutritionists, not necessarily for fresh foods, but for the cable companies, they sort of, you know, oh, well, that's just something that's not digestible. But that's something that's not digestible, I think, that comes from an animal source. There's usually some function or reason for that. So yeah. let's just throw that out as not being something that may be vitally important. Maybe that. Why animals who eat raw diets have a better microbiome? Maybe that's why they have more yeah. and improves their immune system, mm -hmm. levels, and I mean all that. I mean that oh, in, you know, an undigestible fiber that's uh, in the bone is not important. It might be really important, and so we never know. And right. we learn more and more all the time. So going back to nature, and every time, in every case, we want to go back to nature because I think it's always going to provide us with good clear guidance about what we're doing and. You know, it helps us. Um, it, it helps us as a guide, and I think that's something we should always look at and not forget. Never think that we're smarter than nature. <laughs> No, we are not. And that's something, you know, as, as you look at all these elements as well, and you're putting in that whole animal perspective into it, think of also how the animal eats. I mean, your animal, if it was wild, it doesn't pull out a plate and set a place matting out and really make sure it's in a clean environment. No, no, it's eating right off the ground and it's eating elements thing. of the soil, which is a good gut microbiota. Yes, and that's going to offer, you know, maybe there's going to be some plant material, maybe they're going to get yeah. grass, maybe, maybe they take it and bury it. That's a whole other wonderful topic I love. So, <laughs> Barclay Levy, she wrote about it in her 1955 book um, that was natural, uh, or natural, I think it's, I'm not on the title of her book, I'm sorry. Anyway, <laughs> it's been a long week. Um, but, but basically, um, she talks about how dogs, it's, what they do is they, and, and and indigenous cultures and humans for them own for their own food, those cultures will they'll take this, they'll take the meat and bury it, hang it in a tree to age it, which preserves it for longer, but it also improves the uh, you know, basically nutritional quality of the food on, right. on a biological level as far as the microbiome is concerned, or they'll take it and bury it in soil and my, mycelium and all that wonderful matrix of the healthy soil. Now that may not necessarily work if you're like on a golf course or if you have like a manicured yeah. lawn in the backyard, but if you have a really cool place that's really built up a really mm -hmm. amazing soil and kiss the ground is one great place to learn more about that. Joel so Latin is great. There's a lot of great places yeah. you can learn more about that. Uh, white oak pastures, check it out. You can learn a lot about soil and how beneficial these soil farmers and the regenerative mm -hmm. what they're doing. Um, but that soil can function as a preserving mechanism with the bone, but it also helps enhance the microbiome and the um, the nutritional integrity of the meat. So fresh is great for when it comes to taurine and things like that. And kill it and eat it right away. All that fresh blood and organs and things are really important on an amino acid level. Uh, um, level, but then when it comes to on a biological level, sometimes that aged meat or that dry aged meat hung in a tree outdoor somewhere or put into underneath the soil. First, where that I thought that is just absolutely crazy, but now I realize that there's a lot to be said for that and that there was a lot of value in that. And people have just been doing that for thousands of years or hundreds of years, and you know, one really knew why, you know, they don't understand all the reasons why, and we don't even know all the reasons why, but we're learning. Right about that and i think that that's something that we all need to just be mindful of when we're feeding our animals that these are things that were happening and things that serve our animals health long term and our health long term and that those might be things that are missing in the diet yeah mineral basis and you know it, it comes back all full circle from good gut microbiota to good whole food sources that are ethically raised. And you're talking about if you're looking at nutrition from just one myopic level, you're short sighting it is really you're taking a look at the, all the pieces and parts that go into creating a well balanced. And I know we kind of cringe when we hear balanced diet, but I mean, there's really about letting nature help balance that diet out. Yeah, I mean, you just really want to look at like the whole animal. And then you I mean, think about looking at the whole animal, what would that look like if I would put that on a plate somehow? And, you know, and everybody has different things available to them locally and what they're able to get when it comes to like plants and it comes to the blood and all these sort of you know, eating the whole nose to tail or beak to tail or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. That, you know, 
that's really important and to do that as much as you possibly can and if you can't then there's other things you can buy like you can buy glandular supplements you can you know buy ancestral supplements i've mm -hmm. that order for a while but um they have these great products that are all from uh you know grass-fed grass-finished animals and they have all the different organs um north star bison i usually get glands from them i think that they're out of stock right now but I just talked. <laughs> but uh, but you can get them from them. Um, there's you know online resources where people can find these good clean glands that are come from a, a New Zealand source would be fine. Um, those right. are the component of the diet that might be missing, and you want to make sure that that's included. There's all these things you look at the whole animal, and you try and do the best you can. And then, like for example, if you can't get your man on blood, maybe you try and use more of a seaweed blend or something like that too. Mm -hmm. So this provide a lot of similar components. Um, but you know, just just do the best you can. Everyone's a little bit in what they're available to, what was available to them. Um, but that there's a lot of great options and to mix it up even, you know, that's always a good idea too. Yeah, I love it. Well, thanks Casey for the show today and talking about calcium and going into deep dive on the different elements of calcium. Yes, I know we're almost at, we're, we're at 50 minutes. Oh my gosh, it's not. Talk to you about that because we didn't want to. I do. Can you just say a few words about your test results and a little bit more? I do want to hear more because I want to test calcium and she was low on calcium and we bumped up her her bone uh, in her diet, which she's super happy about because that's really. Oh, yeah. And I was worried about it because I was thinking, oh, she's gonna have too much calcium if I feed her that much bone. But then when I did the test with you, we learned that she was a little low and she was fine to get more bone. So I've been trying to honor that and, and see what we're going to do. So we're coming up in the next month or two, I'm probably going to do another sample with you and find out where we're at. And we get some news to see with making some adjustments to our diet based on your test, what that looks like. But you yeah. have seen a lot of the tests that come through, but they are a little bit low on that calcium for dogs. And, and yes. uh, you know, you saw one that was a little bit over and I don't know what the, what was happening there. Were they over supplementing with a calcium supplement? Was it bone or was it actual calcium, like calcium citrate or something, or what were they doing? Right, the dog was getting over supplemented with calcium, but also what was happening, um, no, I think really, I think when we, I'm thinking back, I'm picturing the test right now. So yes, that dog was over supplementing. I think they were actually feeding too high a level in the diet, so too high of a percentage in the diet. And so really most of the low tests we come through and we see is the actual individual is not feeding enough. They're not feeding enough of, let's say, like a prey model raw, or they're not feeding enough raw diet, or they're home preparing their meal, and they're supplementing with just eggshell powder. And they're not giving the dog a bone because out of fear of giving your dog bones, because we've been told don't feed a dog a bone for splintering purposes. So I think they were holding back on that on a few of the tests that we see. But typically, it's due to just inadequacy on or uh, misunderstanding of how much they need to feed their dogs and activity level plays into it as well. So if your dog is sedentary, you're not going to need as much in the diet and you're not going to need to feed as much, but you taking, let's take a, a GSP, German short hair pointer, very active, very moving a million miles an hour and they're hunting with the dog and then they're only feeding it two and a half percent of its body weight per day. And then, you know, that's something that when we analyze the test and our vet takes a look at it and we look at activity levels in the pet, that is something that we want to basically encourage. It's okay to feed more, but really, and I love how you said it is, take a look at their feces. How are they pooping? Is it firm? Is it more of like that hard rock? Like, you know, and at some point I was really glad that you went through that because Leo is pooping rocks. And so on that kind of level, I'm like, oh my gosh, is this right? And to know that, okay, yes, I am feeding adequate calcium levels because that, burp, that poop is getting firm. If it's that loose stool, maybe too many carbohydrates. And if you're feeding- Too many people, organs, organs. I always tell people that the easy yeah. way to remember is liver loosens, bones bind. Yep. So if you need to bring the poop together, feed more bone, if, the, if it's, you know, if you fed too, you're feeding too much liver or other secreting organs, yeah. But that gives you a kind of easy way to remember it. So maybe right. liver, kidney, spleen, things like that. Um, your the diet's gonna the, the, the uh, elimination that you'll see the feces is gonna be darker, tarier, um, 
been like really loose and that's going to be because they don't have a requirement themselves or the tolerance at least for that much organ you may want to back off a little on the organ or make those finer adjustments based on your animal and right. tolerance for those things and, and just, that may change over time i mean maybe right now they mm -hmm. can't have that much organ and maybe a year from now they might need a lot more organ or depending right. on their year or depending on their stress levels and mm -hmm. you know, each have very high like the, I always tell people that the vitamins and the minerals are the organs. Because they go, well, what about the veggies? I need to add a carrot because, or an apple because they need vitamins and minerals. I'm like, oh my gosh, no, you're feeding a carnivore. And a carnivore is going to get all the best sourcing and the most bioavailable forms of their nutrients. All their vitamins and minerals and trace, and all that stuff's going to be in the form of animal foods. And right. So it's going to be your organs are going to be the, I would say, think of that as your vitamins and your minerals. And mm -hmm. You know, of course, there's a, a huge mineral component with bones, which is obvious. Yeah. I always try to remind them of that. Yeah. And so, and then another thing I want to mention is we actually have a new test now. You do? We can test for glyphosate. That's so awesome. I actually have a member who was talking to me about that. And yeah. And she got the test result back. I might see her tonight, actually. For her, it's so exciting. She She's gonna it. be doing an amazing plating for her dog. Who, she has this awesome Instagram account, and she has awesome pictures that are so beautiful for her mastiff. Dinah, yeah, dining with Dinah. You guys should check it out. It's super cool. But she will. Her birthday plating of a really incredible. We went and got some special stuff for her today, so it's super awesome. Cool. Anyways, that's forthcoming. I don't want to spoil the price, but I think that she actually may have run a test. If I'm thinking correctly. Um, and I don't know if it was through you or through someone else. I don't know if there's other companies doing it, but what an interesting test to done and how informative and helpful that would be to learn about. I mean, the, it, it, I would not be surprised if most modern dogs have a certain level. And then also just to learn, like, are they able to detoxify that? How are they handling that? Like, maybe some animals can handle it better than others. And, you know, why? How interesting. That's so cool. It's scary as hell, Kate, Casey. Oh. Don't show 10 times above the dangerous level of glyphosate. And it's usually due to a grain-free diet because uh, highest glyphosate levels are in garbanzo beans, lentils, peas. And so anything time that is supplemented into the diet, that is what they're spraying glyphosate on in the farm fields. And that's what we're feeding our dogs. And also they indirectly get it from walks. I mean, they got their nose to the ground, but something that they've noticed is dogs that are fed raw show very little levels of glyphosate. That's great. Well, that's a nice relief. How wonderful is that? That's I know. What a nice thing because of the cancer rates that we have in our animals being so high. And that's right such a huge risk and you know what's really funny is because there's been so much in the media about that recently there's more than one person has said because i was saying oh gosh they're spraying the roundup in the parks and, and in San Francisco, they really don't do it in our city parks they do it in our natural areas which is yeah. more groovy and the they're, because they're if they weren't doing this mm -hmm. it'd be very natural so they but they yeah. go to the natural area and make it more natural i mean <laughs> they yeah. spray it with Roundup to get rid of the unnatural plants, which are the non-native species, the whole thing. Anyway, but um, if you just left it, it'd be pretty natural. Yeah. Anyway, but they don't, and they go in and they fuss with it, and they yeah. have to spray these areas, um, right. which is an absolute tragedy to me. And it is, you can still buy it, people still use it, it's still being used. Um, but a lot of people are like, isn't that illegal? That's not legal. People can't get, use that anymore. No, yeah. that's true. It is everywhere and in our food system. Mm -hmm. In our food system, all of these seeds that they're growing for agriculture, a lot of them are adapted to grow with, in concert with that as part of the program as far as being able right. to bring that to market. And that includes how it's being, you know, how it's being, you know, not only you know, the seeds planted and harvested, but then after harvesting. Yep harvesting they're spraying them with more two weeks before harvest they spray the crop again to dry it out so then it's easier to harvest so you're seeing glyphosate is all over and it's one thing that's good about glyphosate is it actually chelates out of the system within seven days oh so you can make a change there's hope for this if you can make a change to the diet 
and remove 100% of the glyphosate out of their system by just a change in their diet. But if we don't know the source of it, or if we don't know that it's an issue, then will we take the corrective actions? Because they're seeing things, and this is all part of an animal exposure study that this test, not only do you get the results, but you actually become part of the animal exposure study. And then starting to start changing how they formulate diets in actual kibble, and also in how they're gonna regulate it in other industries that affect animals. That's great. Yeah. So, change that. Well done. That's awesome. Yeah, we're super excited about that. Like the, the, are there things that you've seen or noticed um, besides changing the diet, which of course is the biggest and most dramatic change and you can have the biggest bump with, like you can get the most return on your investment? <laughs> For an actual yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but what, yeah, what, what else are you noticing? Like, like healing foods, like herbs or different? Yeah, what are you noticing that can be also helpful when? Maybe they're already feeding a raw diet and then they come back with a high level. What is their body Life to support them with, the, with detoxifying from that? Well, and then you got to take, take a look at the environment of what's around them. And it's stuff that, you know, for chelating out of the system, because it removes so quickly within seven days, I have not taken it further to take a look at, is there a product that can actually bind to glyphosate and remove it being that it's an herbicide? but really just allowing the body to naturally press it out of the system. It's not gonna sit and you know, infiltrate on that, in that standpoint, but taking a look at water sources, because yeah. you're next year, I mean, definitely you guys are in the agricultural belt of the world. You, this, California, where you guys live is where we get our food from, That's the rest right. of the United yeah. States. So when you're living next to farm fields and stuff like that, and they're spraying it, you know it's gonna get into the groundwater, you know it's gonna seep into soils, and you know with all of that, and then if you, you're walking along, now I know in Colorado here, if you see a really green lawn, you know they are spraying the crap out of that lawn. Um, and so you just avoid walking your dog in that lawn so they don't get it on their paws and then lick their paws and all of that type of stuff. But usually it's vegetable matter. So what will happen is, is we'll get individuals that are feeding vegetables to the dog, let's say cucumbers, and they're cutting up cucumbers and they're sharing them with their puppy at night. Well, indirectly, they could be getting glyphosate exposure to that. And if you're doing that every day, it never leaves the system. It's constantly recycled. That's yeah, a maintaining cause. Yeah, you're yeah. just keeping up. Right. So, yeah. So, no, we're super excited about that test. And we're super Where can excited. Where that to... test? Is it on your website? Yeah, you can go to our website and purchase the test right there. And uh, the lab that uh, conducts it is HRI Labs out of Iowa. And we are good friends with Larry Boland, the... Um, oh the head scientist at HRI labs. And there's a reason I love Larry because you know, that non GMO label that's on all of our food product, him and his partner, John are the ones that made that and created the standard of, about it and then gave it away to food companies to say, go put this on all the food that's not genetically modified that meets this standard. That's great. That sounds like he has his heart in the right place. And yeah, a visionary and working hard and idealist. Working hard. So those are the people that I have the most on. And those are the ones I love supporting is if we can help them with this study and we can help them with everything that we're doing. Yeah, why wouldn't we do something like that? So that was cool. a no brainer for us to bring that test on. We just need to start getting cats tested for me next. I know. Well, with the glyphosate test, I can test dogs, cats, and horses. Okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah. Now, with... No, we need to talk eventually someday about how we can create a large, no, increase your sample size for kitties. And I'm talking to Dr. David Watts right now, and I'm trying oh. to get him. And if Dr. Watts, if you're watching this, you know I'm going to call you again this week about cats. <laughs> so. Like that. That'd be so cool. I mean, I think it's just, it's, they need it too. <laughs> no, and I, I would love to start testing kitties. Uh, awesome. Well, thank you, Matt. Well, thank you so much, Casey, for the show today. It was awesome as always. And uh, definitely anybody that's out there, and you live anywhere in Northern California, see Casey at San Francisco Raw. Oh, and yeah. can they order for any of their stuff online with you? Well, here's the thing with our website. So our website isn't a direct reflection of what we actually have in store. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually a little bit stale, so there's things that we don't have. There's also at least a minimum of three, even 4,000 SKUs that are not on the website. Wow. 
we usually recommend people give us a call and we can help them like get an order together within minutes and have them pick it up outside. Um, and up until basically today, we have been um, not since this COVID uh, shelter in place happened, um, a lot has changed. And so we're yeah. fitting our population um, to make sure we're taking good care of our members to only current and existing members. But we have come up with a program where we're able to um, serve the needs of non-members in addition to people who would like to join because we just have a huge number of people that are, you know, now at this point, they're like, I really need help and we want to help them. So yeah. but we don't want to do it at the risk of our employees' health. We don't want to do it at the risk of uh, inventory uh, and supply available to our current members who will always have priority. But we have come up with a program. So there is, we are doing that, actually implementing that today and through the weekend where we'll be able to serve non-members and get new members in. Um, they won't be able to enter our facilities. We're gonna do everything virtually, um, but that's really because, you know, this COVID thing, it's, it's gonna be going on for a long time. And yeah. so first it was just a few weeks and now we've, it's been extended and we had to come up with a way to make sure that we can meet the, the needs of those people who really need us right now, mm -hmm. um, but without risking the health and safety of, and, um, you know, making sure that our members are all taken care of first. That's awesome. Good for you. So case in point, just call them. Call them. Give them a call. Talk to their team anyway, but over you there. Ready to answer. So thank, <laughs> thank you so thank much, you. much for the show today. I really appreciate it. Uh, all right. <laughs> awesome. All right. Next Be week, safe. every week, Friday, guys. This is Friday. Be together every Friday. Yeah. And Matt has other shows going. How, how many a week now? You're like, many days during the week doing these tours. yeah we have two other shows i have dr judy jasek on tuesdays at noon love her so much she's my i'm oh. super fan of dr jasek so i we're, we're starting to do a question and answer format for her show so we're watching facebook and then if as people put in questions she will answer those questions i love her wow. she anyone needs help with on a veterinary level oh. remote awesome awesome yes. huge endorsement from her she is my yes on top of that right now i love her to death and refer everyone to her um and then i'm, I'm going to bring on some new shows coming up too See? awesome what you got awesome things so that's going to be happening as well so thank cool you. so keep an eye out i love Our it class. everyone stay healthy stay safe yes everybody stay safe social distancing practice it it's temporary not permanent all right thanks. all right we'll see ya Thank you.